Um, trying to sum up civic technology, I was thinking of making this not boring. Um, so I wanted to look at, say, four statements that could kind of unpack at least what civic technology means for us. And it's more of a bunch of inequalities. First of all, technology f for technology's sake does not promote equality. In fact, often it widens um, the inequality gap. That just because we have knowledge, it in itself will not change things. That the current idea of smart cities doesn't care about people. And that just because things are open does not mean that they're democratic. Now, these are all <laughs> fairly um, potentially upsetting statements and they're not meant to bring the mood down. They're actually powerful opportunities and there have been concerns or mentions of concerns about what, what are humans going to do in an AI or machine-driven world. It's, this space gives everything of why we need humans. And I like to believe that civic technology is the for now on this, is how can we make sure that these this doesn't keep happening and that we can ensure that the powerful and awesome technologies that we're developing are actually going to have real impact and real change. Um, and so, yeah, and so I'm also not saying that we, <laughs> we know how to do this properly. It's we're stumbling around, we're trying to figure out what it means to genuinely work in this space, but um, we certainly are trying. And so just to give you a bit of, bit of an introduction on, on what we do and who we are, um, we're primarily, we're a non-profit that's primarily focused on driving people-centered um, informed decision-making with the primary focus of providing um, pot like participatory democracy. The ability that you actually allow people, any person in a community or in a society to be able to engage with, impact and benefit from. Um, the society and to be given the agency to change it if they need to. Now these are all very lofty, they're all very grand, um, it's very hard to do. Um, but we, this is the kind of road we want to set ourselves on. And there are two halves of what we do. Um, I'm, my role sits primarily in the um, Civic Data Lab side, the, the yellow side, um, on the right, and that's focusing on how do we use the technologies like data science, machine learning, web development, tool development, to assist with this. And once again, tech is not meant to be the water, it's the pipe. This is what our founder and um, CEO, Richard, um, speaks about a lot, is that it's always, tech enables, it does, or assists, it's not the reason, people are the reason. And then our Open Cities Lab is how do we make, that's the bit that makes sure that this has meaning and has impact, so action research. So Africa's communities are often researched to death and with very little coming back. How do we make sure that if we're doing research, that there's a return of knowledge, a return of assistance, a, a true contract between um, the, the society, parts of society we interact with. Um, genuine community engagement, not to, to try and derive narratives that we want to hear, but that the narratives that actually exist. And finally, data storytelling. How do we make data accessible? Like the name open data, we're, we're in the process of conceptualizing our own name and whether we should change it or not because just pure openness is a challenging word. Just because the data is there doesn't mean that it's usable. You can't just say, cool, we've, we've, we've opened up data portals of all the information you could possibly want, but if people aren't enabled to leverage it, then it's not truly open. It's available. And so that's data storytelling is how do we take data and make it accessible to everybody who should have the agency to work with it. Um, and today, this is actually kind of more of a, <laughs> it's to tell you a little bit of the stuff we're doing, some really exciting opportunities that we've identified. Um, we'd love to collaborate with anybody who wants to collaborate, but it's not a collaboration pitch. It's more, these are things that we've noticed in our three years, and if anybody wants to research them, it'll be super, super cool. Um, so we're going to focus in on four case studies with partners. We usually work, all our projects usually have a partner in another organization. We're going to look at some state-owned enterprise monitoring with the SOS Coalition up in Johannesburg. Uh, media accountability, I don't know if any of you know Media Monitoring Africa. They're a media watchdog um, and we assist them with their big data platform that runs their, that does their media analytics. Um, community engagement, where we're working with mining communities, um, particularly on the West Rand. And then looking at community typologies. How do we start to find a 
good reference frame to make sure that development plans in this country cater for the local nuances of individual communities and societies. Um, so these are just just a, a best of, of the kind of some of the stuff we're working on. So um, accountability watchdogs, particularly if you're looking at something like the SABC, let's imagine you're trying to unpack what, um, what if they're troubles, if they're good things, things that are, um, how to unpack the mire of information required to analyze as something as large as the, as the SABC. You're dealing with newspaper data, you're dealing with legal filings, you're dealing with um, financial reports, you're dealing with <laughs> television broadcasts. How do you unpack information from that? And um, SOS Coalition is an organization that is continually on, keeping an eye on the SABC, making sure that things are open and fair with it. Um, and what we've developed, helping them develop, we're working on it, is a tool by which they can create connections between pieces of information that they identify. So identify key people, fundamentally people, that work with or for different entities or organizations. And what are the interconnections between them? Um, because to understand how these sorts of things work is to understand a very complex network. And so um, we, we've believed that by working on a project like this, we can expand it seamlessly and as open source for other organizations to use to monitor other state and enterprises. Some big names probably come to mind. Um, and basically this is just an example of kind of how we break it down. Let's imagine you've got a newspaper article and still very human driven at the moment and that's one of the opportunities later. But let's imagine you've got a newspaper article and you can identify, this is an actual news article, we're not making this up. Um, you identify specific connections of different types. So we've got L, A, U, and F, legal, um, affiliation, utterance, and financial. These are basically networks in a net, uh, connections between two nodes in a network graph. So it's a directed graph. Who was suing who? Who took action on who? Who is affiliated with whom or what? Who said what about whom or what? And who paid who or what? And that's basically the essence of this model. It's building up this connection of nodes and this network of nodes and connections of varying types. So that eventually, with critical mass, you could start to say, okay, what are all the financial flows out of the SABC over this tenure? Or who was the second order beneficiaries of payments? Or which legal networks? Who was the representing lawyers across all of these cases? This is not to try and, <laughs> this is trying to just drive transparency. The goal is transparency. It's not necessarily supposed to be about going after people. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is the, the fundamental idea with this. And this is an example using a media report, but you could also use financial reports, government gazettes, um, various forms of information as to act as your source material. And some of the opportunities and challenges that we're facing is can we automatically begin to extract information of entities and the connections between them? So this is challenging to do individually. You're trying to get critical mass. We're in a world of powerful NLP, but I have another project that I'll mention in a bit where it's challenging in our context to use natural language processing. It's not good with anything other than Western languages, at least classically Western trained. So how do we start to understand our own turn of phrase, our own journalistic styles, um, in a way that we're able to automatically pull out this information. And there's some cool work being done by tools such as um, Aleph, is a great system that was used to work with a lot of journalism data, um, and some of the systems that were pioneered in the um, Gupta leaks, things like that by some of our partner organizations. And the next challenge is that AI-assisted curation. So it might be that the best option is, can you get an AI to just only make the human make the decisions where the AI doesn't know what to do. And I think that's a very cool thing. It builds on, um, on I think, on all the, the previous talks of the session is we don't necessarily want a machine to be doing everything. Can we just help it make sure that it lines up all the questions that the human needs to answer? Um, some of the very cool stuff, this is the nerd coming out. What are, the, what are our abilities to recognize patterns in these networks now? So how do we start to think about, okay, what is a pattern that is indicative of nefarious activity? What is a pattern that indicates um, unfair prosecution? These are the, this is the kind of 
um, these are very exciting opportunities that we're looking forward to working on, but naturally, for a small team, we'd love for other people to come and <laughs> really dig into that with us. Um, and how does network, how do, how do the networks grow? Can you predict, based on the growth of a network, whether there's, a, there's something bad about to happen? And it, it, I'll mention it again under our project with the mining communities, but can you predict the time series patterns that lead to something like Americana? What are your warning signals, even just to tell people, hey, pay attention? And then finally, once you have, are there, a, are there ways, and neural nets are very, very good. I use neural nets as, uh, sparingly because I'm actually, it's weird that I'm talking at um, Deep Learning and Darbo because I, uh, I, I don't really trust them. I know how powerful they are and I think they're amazing, but I also just don't trust them because I can't see under the hood. Um, but I'm sure that many people feel that. Um, but one of the things that I know they're particularly good at and have used them for is being able to blend text and numbers. And particularly, there's a cool opportunity to how can you start to look at the text and match it to financial flows or other means of detecting um, networks that are happening. Then another following on to this, which is similar, and in fact, they, the two organizations sit in the same offices, is this media accountability and trying to f fight for a free and fair media, which South Africa often touts about itself, is that it's got the freest and fairest media. Um, but <laughs> that requires a lot of work to maintain, and I think it, it, it still is. We are facing still a lot of bias and agenda. Um, and this is done with, yeah, Media Monitoring Africa. They've, they have their tool Dexter, which we maintain and expand. Um, and the goal is to try and make sure that media is representative across gender, across race, across um, geography. Are we only reporting on the f like three most populous provinces and we're completely neglecting most voices? Are we representing children? Are we only asking politicians and academics? Are we not asking the people enough? Um, and so trying to, make, trying to work um, with them to ensure that. And so this is just an example of the pipeline that we, that we work with. We pull news from over 100 sources from around South Africa, and then you start adding more um, across the rest of the continent. Um, this gets crawled either through audio into natural language processing or just through raw text into natural language processing. It was great, and we've just recently been doing a lot of work now with the elections, and we've been looking at audio transcription. It was very cool to see that, because naturally you always think these cool tech, Google, Amazon, IBM, Azure, and a startup from London, England knocks them out the park in audio transcription. It's a small company called Trint. Um, and utterly superb in terms of audio transcription, um, which was quite cool to see. Um, and they also have a journalistic heart, and they've, they've, they've given a lot of um, assistance for this elections project, which is really cool. Um, but once you've done this natural language processing, you're trying to pull out sources, so who said what, about entities, places, other people, um, these sorts of things. So it's saying, okay, who is saying what about what? And so that's a, it's a simple data model, like initially, but it creates a hugely complex thing to unpack. Um, and then once you've, once you've got all of this in the database, you're able to say, okay, how can I collect a couple of articles and make a collection that I want to analyze? I want to look at all the Words. We've done a couple of things, um, say looking just at state capture as a word. Who's using it? Um, how many times it's being said? Whose opinions are being asked about it? Um, and this is the, the, the platform that then can allow you to go and run analytics on those articles. Build a collection, interrogate. Build another collection, interrogate. Now, this was released by Media Monitoring Africa. I recommend checking out their website. They've been releasing a lot of news reports. Um, where you can start to see now over the recent, just over March, what is the coverage that different parties are being given in the digital online media, as well as radio, as well as um, written. And you start to see, okay, there are definitely some things, but you also start to see, <laughs> you start to see some very scary other truths. This is the breakdown of sources asked about politicians, asked about the elections. And the scary thing is this is an improvement, this breakdown. So this work does allow you to start unpacking issues that are in the media. Um, but once again, you're now faced with the challenge, did we extract the articles or look at the articles that suited the mission we were writing on? So who is helping, what's acting as the counterpoint even to our bias when we're supposed to be checking the machines for bias, which is, is challenging. And so, as I mentioned earlier, big challenge, transcription is not good outside of the Western context. 
and we need to get better. I know there's work in, in at Stellenbosch that's being done, particularly focusing on code switching between English and Zulu, but it's interesting that that there's, I, I could only find one lab, so maybe I'm just not very good at searching anymore, being out of academia for a while. But there's a huge opportunity to really dig into the like computational linguistics and um, the, the neurological space. L uh, libraries like Spacey that allow you to include your own neural nets, improve your own training sets, there's an opportunity to play there, which I think would be very powerful in this work. As I mentioned, our project-based curation, are we skewing our own data sets? I went to look at trying to do automated topic identification on this by just doing something like a bag of words representation of all the articles that we've got human curation on and try and figure out using SVD what, is, what, are, the, what are the principal vectors that define the set. And they were all about elections and children in the media, which unfortunately are MMA's <laughs> main two topics. So the problem is that the topic identification is directly influenced by their training set. I mean, should have expected it, but it was once again interesting to see that. And so it's how do you make sure that your sets are not biasing your identification of other topics? And so there's, there's an opportunity there to improve. Um, basically, I imagine being able to leverage not just the words, but who are the, introduce the concept of people. What are the entities? What are the companies being spoken about? What are, there's more than just their names and occurrences. What are their links to words? What are their links to themes? Kind of coming up with a more holistic topic identification system. And then driving after agenda. Do certain journalists always reference certain sources on certain topics? Is there a clear agenda that's happening? And more interestingly, does the traditional media lead or follow the social media? If an article is written, does social media respond, or do we start to see the articles coming after tweets go out, or themes are introduced, and so you're basically being influenced. The drive of the media is being influenced by what people are talking about because you're, you're, a lot of media runs off um, adverts. Another part of big data in business is your adwords and your addition of um, targeted marketing. Then the next project is that community is a community engagement project with SETI. This is now in very in early phases where we've, we've been busy just working out how do we conceptualize community engagement in a data-driven way. And so that we're not good. We're not good at asking communities what they want. So people will do either a required consultative process or if you're going to go out and understand a community, it will be over three days. You'll ask a couple of guiding questions even if you don't know that they're guiding, you're going to gather the data and have an understanding of what that community was like at that snapshot in time. There's no temporal resolution. There's no ability to grow an understanding of communities information-wise. And so this project is looking at trying to break that, trying to genuinely um, not, and also trying to put humans first. This is where tech is following the humans that go in. This is from how do we just make our data acquisition from human engagements better so that we can keep building a legacy or a narrative about places so that when you now go to the table with mining companies or any company actually, but we're just focusing here, that when you've got local government, um, local leadership, community members, mining companies all at the table, you can talk about a plan with data that everyone has been given access and agency on to direct to work towards a cohesive plan where everybody can win. So the idea is basically just coming up um, with a way of storing the data such, in such a way that it can easily be aggregated without driving, changing the process, trying to make sure that it's as organic as possible. Once again, big challenge, we're, we're, we're testing it and it's a, hopefully we'll have a lot of cool stuff to report here but then be able to take this information and translate it in a way that it makes sense to the various stakeholders. What are the pains that local government have to deal with that this can provide to let them deliver on their mandate? What do the mining companies need to ensure that they do their investment spend well? And that by, in, fundamentally that the communities will maximally benefit where possible. Um, and so here we have the ability now, how do we know that the way we ask the questions are not driving the data sets that we get back. So basically building in that, that bias detection from the beginning. How do, we, how do we prepare for mistakes that might happen? Um, does the language, the original language, when translated, affect the data distributions? Because we're working with diverse numbers of languages in this country. Um, 
algorithms work well in English. <laughs> what is lost in the mapping? Um, we've, got, we've got a data narrative globally that is rooted in, in English. How do we make sure that we're not being misdirected there? Um, can we identify good patterns in the data of cohesive and divisive? How do we learn from one community and use it to benefit another? And then, as I, as I said earlier, what is the timeline to tragedy? Can we detect that? Can we know when there's immediate call to go in before something boils over, before people get hurt? And it's always, almost always, the people who, need, <laughs> who least deserve it that the bad things happen to. And then finally, how can you start leveraging, bringing in alternate data sources? How can we start to identify arable regions that mines could use? How do we start to look at types of growth of communities such that we can understand what works well and what, work, what doesn't? What is the burden on infrastructure? Can we predict, predict infrastructure fails before they happen? Um, and then finally, last one, um, and also if, you, if I'm holding you guys from lunch, you're welcome. Please go. <laughs> Please go. I'm not going to take offense. Um, but um, trying to also understand that community needs are very varied and you have um, development plans that are designed by several different bodies at several different echelons of government that now need to try and represent many different people, but it's not, there isn't a clear way of understanding what is the local nuance in a development plan. How do, we, do you need to have different strategies for different wards, or even lower than that, wards are too generalized? How do you work at a specific community level without making the process grind to a halt due to it being just too unwieldy? And so the goal here, this is with partners um, in, in Joburg um, social surveys, looking at can we develop almost a topology based on certain data sets where we identify types of communities that are nationally continuous, that provide a national sampling frame that, I mean, once again, it's very hard to say, can you classify people as one thing or another? But can we find classifications that allow for the, maxim the maximized allocation of resources? And so this is trying to find good data sets, big challenge, um, trying to find enough data sets to describe a complex human problem. And then even then, um, making sure that we're not tripping ourselves up. But we did some work um, where we've looked at, based on this model, can we start to predict indicators of unrest, things that are at the cause of what communities um, are, will take to the more, like, more structured reporting of problems. Like, will you, will you contact your local municipality? Will you, um, do you have access or agency? Or is the only way that you're going to get heard by having to really make people take notice? And how do you make sure that you don't, people don't have to be driven to that point? Um, as I mentioned, limited data for complex situations. Can we expand to a multi-dimensional understanding of communities? Um, can we predict social issues? Are there certain markers where we realize that this is a community that we've seen before may have mental health challenges? Are there early childhood development challenges that we can already start planning for, um, like help local government know that this is something worth investigating? And being able to, where do we need to fit the holes in our data so that we're not completely off track? So. That's just a little bit about what we do. Um, I think there's so much cool stuff that technology can bring, and so to build on the original slide, that technology gives us the opportunity to really start addressing these things. It helps us with frameworks. So knowledge, the knowledge institutions of the world are great at strategy, planning. How do we close the gap between civil society and research institutes? How do we leverage that technology and that knowledge to put them into a framework where smart cities are very popular, you'll get a lot of money for smart cities. They're powerful, it's a powerful framework to work with, but can we use it to make sure that when we, that openness and the sharing of data and the introduction of technology enables people to all have agency over their community? I've tried to remove that, it wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> I, was, I copied the slide and I tried to delete it, sorry. Anyway, that's, that's a little bit of, and that's, that's all I have, but more than happy to take a couple questions. Um.